Okay, so what, what's the problem with uh, protected areas management at the moment? Well, there's, obviously there's a whole bunch of issues out there, but one of them is that protected areas generate a whole wide suite of services, but protected managers usually only measure one or two, and it's usually about uh, meeting conservation targets, and the other one is about tourist receipts, okay, so how much money they're making. If you try and look for data on how many people actually go to parks in South Africa, you will find many holes in the data. So there's a whole whack of services that are not measured. Okay, and which means that all those other services which are not measured are given a zero value. Okay? And that's through, because if you don't discuss them, they're just going to have a zero value. So it's not very surprising that protected areas are not, uh, are not getting much attention and they're not valued. So they're hugely undervalued in society. And so as decisions are taken at strategic levels in the province or the country, protected areas are just their own feature. Let's try and get some action here. Okay. No, this, hey, is there another machine? Okay. <laughs> So because you say so little about what you offer society, you know, is this the enduring image that we have of the role of protected areas? Okay. <laughs> all right, you all know about this stuff. This is what you all focus on as managers, okay? You're all very good at understanding Things like fire management, burning frequency, and all your management plans are all orientated to this kind of, this kind of action. But while you do this, this is such a frustrating machine, there's a whole lot of benefits that you generate that you never talk about, that are often not measured, and unspoken about. Just have a look at that. You can see... Um, you know, your focus is on basal cover. That generates things like the more basal cover you've got, the more infiltration you get, the less runoff you get. That increases, oof, my word. This is a very difficult beast. My word, how are we going to go back now? Okay. Okay, so then you're going to generate, with more infiltration, you have less base flow and more winter water. More infiltration, more storm, less storm flow, less flood damage. And so it goes on. So the whole suite of services that you create by your actions, and none of those will feature in management plans. None of them feature in your discussions about the role of protected areas. Okay. So how can you add value to what you're doing? Because you're doing a whole lot, but you're understating what you're doing. So one of the opportunities is to start focusing on ecosystem services and what they do for society. So start talking to people about these other things that you actually generate. And if you were to start to focus on ecosystem services, you can start to show a commitment to society without actually having to compromise what you're doing. Because you're doing the same, you know, you're doing the job and it's generating all these additional benefits, but you just don't say anything about it. This is a really difficult thing. Okay, and that, um, so when you start to talk about what it does for society, you can start to get legitimacy, because like that other picture with the hippos, you know, if that's the enduring image, then your social license to operate is zero. Your legitimacy in a developing com com country is all about, you know, is it the hippos or is it the people that you're interested in? Kind of thing, okay? And you've got to get beyond that. If you show how protected areas benefit people, you can also start influencing the perceptions of people, okay? Because otherwise, you're driven by that hippo. That's the perception, okay? And if you can start to change perceptions, you've got some chance of changing behavior. Let's see where we're going. All right. The other thing that you can also show is to show the role of protected areas in society. And you do a whole lot of things like economic generation. You do cost saving, you reduce, reduce risk, but that is never mentioned, okay? It's kind of the only thing that you talk about is the, the tourism industry. That's one of the 
So that's the only kind of thing that you find gets discussed. So if you start talking about ecosystem services, you can look at it differently, and I'll show you how we do that in a minute. The other thing that happens is that the dialogue that occurs between treasurers, town uh, managers or city managers, engineers and protected area managers or biodiversity conservationists is like they all miss each other. Okay. They don't have very little in common. Okay. And what, what ecosystem services can do is it can start to provide a common basis for discussion because that's what everybody wants. It's what you produce and it's what society wants. Okay. And if you don't talk about that stuff, how can they possibly know what you're doing? Okay, but to engage with ecosystem services, you need to develop an understanding. And the old classic engineering saying, to measure is to know. Okay, and obviously the opposite is the most important for you guys. Because you don't measure, you don't know. You simply don't know what you've got to offer. In trying to understand ecosystem services, there's a whole hierarchy that you've got to go through. You've got to understand what assets have you got, what's the factory that produces it. The next one is what services that you get. Then it's, it's one thing having a, a fancy restaurant, but if you've got nobody to come, it's a bit pointless. You're not going to you know, make zip out of it. So you've got to know what your demand is. And once you can understand demand, then you can start to put money figures on it. What sort of value is generated from that? And when you have that understanding, you can also talk about the implications of change, what's going to happen to change. So there's a whole lot of things you need to do in understanding ecosystem services. Okay, so understanding your assets. There's natural and transformed. Obviously, you guys are specialists in the natural. But also transformed areas are important, you know, like this grass outside here that you walk on. There's a whole bunch of benefits there, flood reduction, all sorts of things happening. Those all work. So you need to understand those too because there's a whole bunch of... You know, if you think of some of the protected areas, like a place like uh, Longaban or Neisner, there's, there are big urban areas inside protected areas, which also work. It's not all sterile. And you've got to understand functionality, everything about functionality. So that's, this is the stuff you guys are good at, okay? You know, so what are your assets? And what are the services you're getting off them? Okay. The big deep freeze? You know, here we've got... You know, thousands of kilometers of pure forest. Very different set of assets, very different set of services you're going to get out of it. So you've got to be very clear about what assets you've got and so what services you get. The next thing, once you've got that, is to understand the range and the quantity and the quality of services supplied. So there's a list for you. Everybody will find some happiness there on that list, whether you be a a CEO of the Kazan Wildlife, or a city engineer, or a politician. There's a whole bunch of services generate there, generated there which, which meet society's needs. So you want to start understanding what the range of services are from a system. Also about the quantity of services. Different places produce different things. So if you look at the poor old quarry at the bottom here, if I can make this work, very few services, and only one that features there. Okay? If you look at something like grasslands, high levels, mixed bag, the water services in the middle, there's a bit of a gap. You get something like your water bodies, all good around the water services. So each service, or, or each natural habitat, has different capabilities to supply them. So you can start to understand this. Okay? It's not, you don't just have to value things. You can also start to understand what are you producing where and how much. Then you can also tell stories about it, okay? So, for instance, in Seleni Nature Reserve, that stupid little insignificant nature reserve on the main road past Mpongeni. Now, who would have ever thought that this thing is critical to the well-being of Mplatuzi municipality? They don't have a storage dam for that municipality. They use in Sezi Lake. Likewise, that bridge, John Ross, has never been washed away. And it's because it has this huge buffer that's there. Okay. Again, you don't have to have a value, but you can start having these conversations. The Tlui Dam, lifespan of that dam, four times the national average. These are all important things, stories you can start telling about these services without having to have a huge amount 
of data or economic data or, or things out there. Kruger Park, you know, what would we do in South Africa without Kruger Park as a marketing icon? And so on, things like the garden roof down at Nisner Estuary, all those properties looking onto the lake have hugely elevated values. And so hugely elevated rate space for the municipality. But who talks about that? Okay. So these are a lot of stories that you can engage with. The next thing is about demand. Who uses what services? Okay. So who are those people? How many are there? And how important is it in their lives? Here's a list from some work we did in the Berg a number of years back. Just, just a, a couple of services there, there. But you can see for different services... There are different kinds of users. There are global users, okay, because you've got a World Heritage Site at the top there. And there's no other rock art facility like this in the globe. Okay? So there is no alternative. You go to something like Live Game from that area, there's just a bunch of farmers that, are, that would benefit from that. So as you go down the list there, you'll see that there's a different story around what is used. Something like, um, for instance, sediment supply. That's... It's like the trout fishermen downstream of that particular place that we were looking at that are interested in good sediment for the nurseries, for the, for the trout fishing and that kind of stuff. Not that you might want to do that anymore, but nevertheless. You can also map where people are and how they're using things. So, for instance, this is the, um, the Ambilo catchment. And here you can see um, you know, huge demand for the river or aquatic services in the system. This is where all your protected areas are, up in this kind of area. And so very different demands in different places. So you can also get to understand that and map it. Then you start to understand value. So once we understand what services we got, who's using them, you can start to look at value. Um, sorry, let's just try and go back up there again. There are indicative values or potential values. The other thing that you can look at is financial or economic values. And the third one is the kind of social values. They're all quite different. So let's just look at uh, understanding the potential or economic values. And a very important concept here is the value per hectare, because that allows you as protected area managers to understand how much you can provide. Okay. Here's one for the Berg, Drakensberg, that we did, and this was researched. And here you can see um, very specific numbers there that were generated from research. So, very, so each hectare of water in the Berg is generating at least 24 rands worth of water, 38 rands worth of sediment avoidance, and around like 60 rands worth of carbon sequestration. So just some ideas. You can also look at it in a different way. These are using Costanza's values from some time back. But here it's also, you can use indicators. Here we're using the value of let's say, protected areas in the province, 56 billion in comparison to, let's say, the provincial financial budget, which is about 70 billion, versus the GDP of the province, which is about 200. So starting to get it onto the agenda, starting to make comparisons. Now, this is, those are rough indicators, but it's better than zero. The other thing you can start to do is to look at what value does it create, so it's not only what it's potentially worth, but what it creates. So some work that we did in the Bavianskloof, and this is a, a rundown system that they're looking at restoring. And here you can see in the, uh, if you just looked at the, uh, the second column, base flow maximization is a suite of different kinds of restorative, rest, rest, restoration activities. I won't go there. Um, you can see that's going to cost about 600 million to do. The actual the benefit on the ground to the farmers will be about two billion, and to the pr to the economy would be about five billion. So another way of showing how restoration can increase value as you go along. Another way to also look at the economic value of various uh, um, protected areas or natural areas. Here you can see the cost of generating groundwater. It's around the four rand per cubic meter mark. Treatment of return flows, which is coming to Durban shortly, is about six new dams, six to seven rand. Desalination, which is all the up and down the garden route, they're sitting at 12 rand per cubic meter. In the cohort, to generate water is going to cost you about 80 cents. 
chrome, about 150, probably on similar together, down to about 70 cents a cubic meter. So very cheap ways of doing things, okay? And we need to start having these conversations about what protected areas can do. Then there's also the social values, things like nation building, people at the beach. It's about building the nation, household security, you know, the fact that the husband can go and fish and not fight with his wife all Saturday. <laughs> you know, all these kinds of benefits. Cultural identity. I mean, what would the, the Zulu king be without the leopard skins or the hippo or whatever is happening? And, uh, and media exposure, you know, how are you exposed to the media? What are you looking like in the media? From a then these can also change, okay? So services can change, and here, obviously, the capital, if you change the capital or the assets, if you change your money in the bank, it's going to change how much interest you can get. So understanding your, how the natural assets change will influence supply and will also influence how people use that. Just an example to show how you can, um, how services can change. Here you've got um, some work we did with uh, sappy forests. And they were wanting to understand what the implications were of if they don't invest in grassland management. Now, oh my word, this is, we need a driver's license for this thing. Um, the red line we show there is all the services if we bring them down to a, a, a one, Okay. And um, we're interested in the poor management of grasslands. And if, if the forestry industry doesn't invest in their grasslands, this was for one estate, you could see like a substantial decline in service levels. Around about a 20 to 40 percent decline. So again, you don't have to have strict numbers, you, but you can start to have this as a reflection of what goes on. So if you, if you stop managing the Drakensberg Park, this is the kind of thing that you can start to anticipate. So various ways of articulating things. Also, of looking at change, you can also look at the money side. Here's um, changes to the KZN biodiversity values we did uh, about two years ago or so for projected land transformation rates. In 2011, the um, value of biodiversity was about $150 billion. In 10 years' time, we could be looking at a reduction of $17 billion. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, that means that it's 24% of the provincial budget. Okay, so would we be able to find another quarter of the provincial budget? This is very similar for Durban. Durban faces the same thing. Durban's biodiversity values are around the 4 billion per annum mark. Their budget is 25. Okay? Durban has a rates base. 8% of the people pay rates in Durban. And of those, only 4% actually pay. Okay, so how are you going to find more money if you remove protected areas in the biodiversity? Okay, this is the kind of argument one is wanting to have. Then you've got to start communicating this information, okay? And with any new stuff like ecosystem services, it's very hard just to produce nice little pamphlets and put it out. It doesn't mean anything, okay? You've got to go through a process. And what, and what, seems to, what I seem to be learning in my work is that the numbers are less important now as to the social learning process of actually taking people through the process of understanding what their assets deliver and why they must do it. Because if you just go and tell them Durban municipalities' assets are worth $4 billion, the treasurer there will just laugh at you. Krish Kumar will just say, forget it. But because he's gone through the process after, over the last 10 years, he's willing to invest in it. Okay. So something that's very new, you've got to go through a whole process. Then you've got to communicate values. That's also important. So those values are important apart from the process. Sorry, we skipped the one point there. was also inside protected area agencies. You've got to change that as well. The Bokwachters have got to change the way they think to become service providers. And that's huge miles apart. Everybody went to the bush because they hated people. Now the answer lies with people. <laughs> so there's a lot of process you've got to go through. All right, sorry, just nearly done there. We've got to communicate these values like we've shown. Show comparisons, show implications of change. Talk about water security, food security. These are the kind of things that the government is interested in. 
show who and how many people benefit. It doesn't just have to be about a value. You know, when you talk about you know, 150,000 people downstream of uh, Peter Madsburg that depend on certain services, that's, that's a good discussion. It doesn't always have to be about money. You can show job creation. And the other thing to do is, very importantly, with that big list of services you've seen, not everybody's interested in them. So you need to tailor them. Okay? So who's interested in what? Here's a list here, and I'm sure you'll all find something that you find interesting there. But at all the different levels, the biodiversity and protected areas are playing different roles. There's very local roles. There's international roles being played. And so whoever you talk to, you must be talking about the role in their lives. Okay? Because otherwise, if you don't talk at that level, there is no interest. So in conclusion, protected areas are grossly undervalued by protected area agencies. Okay? And remember, nobody else is going to value your house for you. You've got to do it. You've got to build up the argument. Nobody else will do it for you. The buyer is not going to come and say, oh, I think I must pay you more. Okay? You've got to do it. Importantly, to measure is to know. There's a whole lot of options in order to develop this understanding. Tell stories about services, supply, and demand. You can make maps of who's using them, what's produced where. Show the roles in society. Show how many people, who benefits. Is it the rich or is it the poor? Who's benefiting from the stuff? You can, and show values. Show indicative values if you haven't got money for research. Show financial values, economic values, and social values. Also show the change because that's obviously the most dramatic. And there needs to be a focus on informing society of the role of ecosystem services as economic generators, risk reducers, and cost savers. Okay. So here we go. Here's the CEO. He bloody can't see the wood for the trees, but you've got this pile of money under the bed. Okay. So the message is, you know, to stop hiding your value under the mattress and start having identifying what the hell you've got there who's using it, how important it is, and start counting it, start measuring. Okay. You don't want to be like this guy. There we go. Hello, Miles. Miles, could you uh, briefly perhaps explain to the audience the potential for rural people? As you well know, I wrote an article where I said, can people become water farmers? In terms of your ecosystem services, would ratepayers, taxpayers, would the provincial, would governments be prepared to pay people who live in areas where the grasslands or the rivers or the uh, forests, whatever it might be, are of such a value that in terms, can you measure that they look after this land? Can you measure that in, in terms of what it, th those resources that it provides society and thereby remunerate them? Yeah, I think what, what Richard is raising is that the concept of like you can do beef and water together, and that the one diagram showed that. Okay, so that if you if you only produce beef, you produce eighty rands per hectare on a, on the estate. If you do beef on a sustainable basis, you're going to earn twenty rand less than that. You'll only make sixty. But the point is, there are these other benefits which take it up then to well over a hundred rand. But the question is, are people prepared to pay? And I think it's a it's a slow process that is starting to emerge in this country. Okay, so, but it's not easy because, remember, the financial systems, the economic systems of the world have not evolved to trade ecosystem services. They've always been there for free. We don't know how to trade them. So a carbon deal, you can do it, but it takes you three years and 500,000 rand to make the deal. 
It's expensive. We don't know how, but it's coming. And so in water, you're starting to see it. Other countries are successfully trading water, water rights, and all these kinds of things. So it is emerging, and so there are opportunities, and you've got pilots happening around this country where they're trying to make it happen. Just, just like to say thanks a lot, Miles, for that informative talk. Um, and as you saw, that he he's really speeded up his uh, talk. Of the key things that uh, comes out is that ecosystems, goods, and services are a process. It's a process of taking people along in an understanding of a journey towards a way that we can make conservation more palatable in the 21st century. The other thing is that you need to also look at your audience and frame what you're saying to the audience right so that they can buy into it because it's a very good value that most of us don't realize and don't recognize and we need to put it out there. <laughs>